No price like home. History of global real estate prices going back to 1870. Incredibly interesting. Incredibly interesting. Because what I'm doing, I'm doing my retire on Wellington fund research. And of course, Wellington just goes back to 1930, uh, which is good. I mean, that gives us ample uh, info we need to run some planning and evidence. But I'm also going to use the reverse mortgage. Oh, no. As part of the the uh, the idea of maximizing wealth, or not just making sure you don't run out of money. That's first and foremost. But number two is maximizing wealth. Uh, we're not going to do Roth conversions in this simply because there wasn't any then. Um, and maybe going forward, I'll do a book uh, solely on Roth conversions. Well, not maybe I will. But anyway, the problem that we have is there's not a lot of data that looks at uh, real estate prices from the day. The Census Bureau, which I'll share with you in just a second, goes back to 1940. It gives us some semblance of uh, understanding, but you know, if I want more than that, like what was something in 1915? Not much data. So I came across this article from the Dallas Fed, uh, Federal Reserve Board, which goes back to 1870, looking at global prices. And it's very, very interesting. So we're going to share that with you as well. But before I do, let me introduce my new T-shirts. This isn't mine. This is from the Ludwig von Mises uh, Institute. And if you look where I have... Uh, uh, back there someplace but i got a book hold on so let me find it it's called human action by ludwig von mises basically the founder of the austrian school of economics and uh they got the mises institute uh mises.org m-i-s-e-s -E and this is my sales pitch for you to buy t-shirts from the mises institute tu ne sede malice i guess that's where we get the word malice uh, do not give into evil said my man ludwig or Ludwig, and then we got I got this other shirt, Austrian Revolution, Mises University, man, this is fantastic, Austrian Revolution, and then I got my last one, which is pretty cool, Mises knows, it should say Mises says, like that stupid uh, Asada says thing, or I, Asada taught me, or something like that, it should say Mises taught me, because that, that's just dumb, uh, but anyway, and they also have one, uh, inside every socialist is a dictator at heart. It's tough to get on one, one uh, t-shirt, but anyway, the Visas Institute, by all means, go there. I got these, cost them like 35 bucks, good quality, uh, came in two days. I got a little Mises thing on the side here, pretty cool. So, stop mixing politics with financial planning, folks. This isn't politics. This is financial planning. <laughs> Because the alternative is a big government running things down your thought, your head, without you having a chance to think that there could be another way to look at things. And the Austrian school is absolutely free banking. So all these people are uh, against uh, fiat currency. Uh, do they know anything about free banking? And you know, we have a guy named, uh, was it Douglas North, I think? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. But it's been a long time since I looked at that free banking concept. But uh, there's just tons of stuff. The Austrian school that said, oh, man, huh. The monopoly on how do you build a road without government coercion? Yeah, we've, we've done that. How do you have electricity without government monopolies? We had that too. So anyway, look at Mises Institute, Mises.org, and just watch some of their videos on YouTube. All right, so let's go back. So no place like home. And so the first thing I was doing, I was like, man, where can I find some info on, uh, on historical housing? So I looked at the Census Bureau, and this is pretty cool, actually. So we'll see, it goes back state by state, adjusted to 2010, uh, 2000 dollars and the end of 2000. And there's some good information here. I like this quite a bit, actually. It's, it's, in fact, if you go to uh, Census of Housing, Maine, um, you can see all kinds of tables here. Oops, I want to go to tables. Yeah, right here. It, this is cool. There's, I mean, there's a lot. If you're a, a geek like me, you'll just eat this up, man. You've got home values, you've got gross rents. Uh, I like this one. Uh, plumbing. Where is the plumbing in here? Uh, I guess source of water. I thought, yeah, so just tons and tons of information. But the drawback is only goes back to 1940. So just give an example. Adjusted for dollars. If you had a house here in the great state of Georgia in 1940, uh, the median house cost uh, $20,400 uh, and now costs $105,000 at the end of 2000. All right, so that's that. I think that's pretty. I mean, that's adjusted for two thousand dollars and uh, the year two thousand dollars. So, pretty cool. But it doesn't quite give me what I'm looking for because I want to go back a little bit further to 1930. Uh, but this still gives us a pretty good premise. Look, we in the United States from 1940 to 2000, uh, the the house grew adjusted, inflated uh, from three, uh, accounting for inflation from thirty thousand six hundred to one hundred nineteen thousand six hundred. 
uh, in the six decades from 1940 till 2000. So that's a, you know that's a, what's that uh, three yeah three times, uh, but four times that's four times. So increase in cost by 400 percent or value if you want to look at that. You look at my great state of Maine. I'll, it actually dropped uh, from 1990 to 2000. Uh, again, the median housing price uh, dropped adjusted for inflation. So real terms, it dropped quite a bit, as a matter of fact. So Georgia uh, went up from 1990 to 2000 in inflated dollars. Maine dropped. Hawaii dropped. Uh, Idaho went up significantly. And you can see, oh, this is just fun. Uh, like California went down when you're adjusting it for inflation. If you don't adjust it for inflation, watch this. So here's Georgia. This is nuts, man. Uh, house costs not adjusted for inflation, 1940, $1,957. Uh, and today is 111000 in the great state of Georgia. Again, not adjusted for inflation. So that means in 1940, you would have bought that house. You would have had a stroke of check for 1900 bucks, which seems like a pittance now. But you know, back then, it wasn't. Uh, whereas the same house in 1940 costs in Maine $2,008. So basically, Maine and Georgia are the same price. And that's the funny thing is, is that everyone thinks, man, you know, the Northeast is so rich and beautiful. Not rich, but beautiful and whatnot. The interesting thing is uh, Maine and Georgia have been close to the same in price uh, for a long time. And even though Georgia is the deep south, uh, it's been right around the same thing with, with Maine for the long, long time. But now Georgia has actually taken over and it's only going to be, this is in 2000. I find that to be incredibly interesting, actually. Uh, tons of stuff in here. I just, I love data like that. I can read this stuff all day long. Lastly, I want to show you something. Um, uh, homeownership, uh, heating, fuel. It seemed like something else I wanted to share with you on this. Oh, that's right. I did want to go to uh, uh, home ownership. I think that was it. I was looking at that. Well, it's, no, it wasn't that. It was a, hold on just a second. It was a table of second homes, which is interesting. Vacation was right here. Oh, yeah, watch this. So this is interesting. Uh, so all housing units. So let's go to, so in all housing units, we're going to go to in Georgia. Yeah, 3.28 uh, million housing units, of which 1.6% are vacation homes, essentially, for seasonal, recreational, or occasional use. Watch Maine, though. Maine, 15%. And if you read the stuff up here, it's been like that forever, essentially. Isn't that interesting? So Maine, 15% of all housing units in Maine are seasonal, i.e. vacation home from people in Massachusetts, essentially. If you go down, here's New Hampshire, 10%. You go down to Vermont, 14.6%. But then you go to Massachusetts, only 3.6%. And Massachusetts is a beautiful place. Why? Because they all flee uh, to the upper North New, uh, New England, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Isn't that interesting? And it used to be New York. If you go historically, a lot of, be, uh, a lot of second homes in New York, 3.1% now. This is as of 2000. Uh, but if you go down historically, uh, let's see, we go down to... Uh, 1970, we're going to go down to as far back as it goes, I think 1940, yeah, 1940. Uh, New York, uh, the amount of vacations home they had was uh, oh, only 2.9%. I guess it was the earlier days they had a lot of vacation homes in New York. Um, but anyways, there's some articles behind that that said, man, a lot of people had vacation homes in New York, uh, but Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont have always been a top shelf for vacation homes. Isn't that interesting? So I love that stuff. All right. So let's go back here, though, because I want to show you something. This is just, man, incredibly interesting. So uh, abstract. How have house prices evolved in the long run? This paper presents annual house price indices for 14 advanced economies since 1870. Based on extensive data collection, we are able to show for the first time that house prices in most industrial economies stayed constant in real terms from the 19th to the mid-20th century. Uh, but rose sharply in recent decades. Okay, so they attributed, well, let's, we'll keep going, actually. It's interesting. There's two couple dynamics working here, and I, it's, uh, I, you know, let's just keep going. Anyway. All right, so remember, from 19, the mid-19th, the 19th century, the mid-20th, house st prices stayed stable. Hmm, why? Uh, land prices, not construction costs, hold a key to understanding the trajectory of house prices in the long run. Residential land prices have surged in the second half of the 20th century, but did not increase meaningfully before. We argue that before World War II, dramatic reductions in transfer costs expanded the supply of land and suppressed land prices. Since the mid-20th century, comparatively large land augmenting reductions in transfer costs no longer occurred. 
Increased regulations on land use further inhibited the utilization of additional land while rising expenditure shares, shares for housing services increased demand. So they're basically saying, look, you know, when we first in the mid uh, 19th century to the mid 20th century, uh, we're basically out there to get the land for as cheap as we could. Anyone, you know, the Homesteading Act and things of that nature, um, you know, I mean, that's that's pretty interesting to me. Um, and they say because of restrictions, use of land, the fact that the cheap land was gone, um, you know, in terms of there is no homesteading act anymore. You can't just go to freaking Wyoming and set up shop on 40 acres with your mule, uh, which is I still find that to be offensive. 40 acres and mule. What happened? I mean, I, I don't want to get political here, but I get there's something to be said about that. I mean, that's a promise that wasn't uh, adhered to. Imagine that the government line of people well, crazy, which is why my man Von Mises. Do not give in to evil. Evil! Government, not your friend. Not your friend. Um, anyway, so, uh, but they they attributed to the land prices going up because of the transportation costs have dropped down, but the demands of, restri I mean, the restriction uh, has gone up because government regulation and the demands have gone up too because it's easy to get out to these places, whereas before it was not. And unfortunately, we've restricted it. And to be perfectly honest with you, the government owns the bulk of the West. I mean, that's all there is to it. The government, the federal government owns, but I mean, they own a heck of a lot more of state than Arizona, the state of Arizona does. Uh, so let's keep reading some of these uh, abstracts here. Let me just turn that off for a second. And I want to show you a couple of things. It's, I mean, I love this stuff. I can, oh, geez, Louise. Uh, for do introduction, we're not going to read the whole thing because, look, there is, I mean, what, freaking 132 pages. <laughs> we're not going to do that to you. But I am going to go to the United States. So we'll go down to the U.S. here. Uh, USA in your face. Uh, we're going to go down to the U.S. and, uh, and just read some of that because I think you're probably watching from the U.S. And I'm about to put a link in the show notes if you want to read this yourself. All right. For Dorothy, there was no place like home. But despite her ardent desire to get back to Kansas, she probably had no idea how much her beloved home cost. She was not aware that the price of a standard house in the late 19th century was about $2,400. She also could not have known whether relocating the house to Munchen Country would have increased its value or not. For economists, there's no price like home, at least not since the global financial crisis. Fluctuations in housing prices, their impact on the balance sheets of consumers and banks, as well as the deleveraging pressures triggered by house pricing busts, have been a major focus of macroeconomic research in recent years. And, and here we got Schiller, my man Schiller, and Case. So Case Schiller, yeah, remember that Case Schiller index? So we got Robert Schiller out of Yale, and I'm not sure what the guy's name Case is, which is kind of sad. I probably should know that, but I don't off the top of my head. In the context of business cycles, the nexus the nexus between monetary policy and the housing market has become a rapidly expanding research field. See, I like that. Houses are typically the largest component of household wealth. Exactly, exactly. The key collateral for bank lending play a, sol a central role for long-run long trends in wealth-to-income ratios and the size of the financial sector. Yet despite their importance for the macro economy, surprising little is known about long-term trends in house prices. This paper aims to fill the void. I mean, uh, that's why I'm just saying the discount reverse mortgages. I don't, look, I get it. You specifically may not need it. That's fine. But for the vast majority of us not to at least say, is this something I could use? Doesn't make sense to just fall into Dave Ramsey, their scams. Look, man, you might not need it, but households, houses are typically the largest component of household wealth. That, I just, I don't understand this. It's because it's ignorant. Ignorance based on fear, and that's what it is. And that is not to say you should get a reverse mortgage, but doesn't it make sense if it's the largest component of your net worth to at least say, how can I turn this equity into an asset, into cash? Now, there is something called imputed rent. That means if you own your house outright, you don't have the rent to pay, which means you have a whole lot less taxes because you have the rent to pay. So not only do you have less outflow of cash, I don't have to pay rent or mortgage, but I don't need to get the income uh, in order to pay that rent. If I don't need to get that income, it means I also don't have to get an income tax. Does that make sense? So imputed rent is huge. That's why the reverse mortgage is just such a wonderful thing. Not only does it allow you for the imputed income, i.e. I, I, you not know, have to make money in order to pay a rent or a mortgage, but I can also turn into cash that's tax-free too. It's a tax-free both ways. I have the imputed income from not having to get, make money to pay rent mortgage, and I have tax-free income from the house. That's why it's a wonderful thing, in my opinion. All right, so based on historical research, we present house prices indices for 14 advanced economies since 1870. 
A large part of this paper is devoted to the presentation and discussion of the data that we unearthed from more than 60 different primary and secondary sources. There are good reasons why we devote a great deal of printer ink and paper discussing the data in their sources. I like how these guys write. Houses are heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous assets, and when combining data from a variety of sources, great care is needed to construct plaus plausible long-term indices that account for quality improvements, shift in composition, uh, composition of the type of houses and their location. We go into considerable detail to test the robustness and corroborate the plausibility of the resulting house prices data with additional housing resources, historical resources. Um, all right, so under the, using the data set, we're able to show that real house prices in the advanced economy since the 19th century have, have taken a particular trajectory that, to the best of our knowledge, has not yet been documented. From the last, I'm trusting, look, man, I did a pretty significant, about two hours last night while we were watching uh, the Charlie Brown movie with my kids. I was like, where can I find data on house prices? And it was, it was sparse. Now, look, I didn't kill myself. Look, I looked about two hours and I came across this, a couple other things in the Census Bureau. But like they say, uh, to the best of our knowledge, this data has not yet been documented. So not only to me thinking that, but it's these guys too, because they're stating it explicitly. I completely concur because I can find it. From the last quarter of the 19th to the mid 20th century, house prices in most industrial con uh, economies were largely constant in real terms. But by the 1960s, they were on average not much higher than they were, or by the 1960s, they were on average not much higher than they were on the eve of World War I. They have been on a long and pronounced ascent since then. For our sample, real house prices have approximately tripled since the beginning of the 20th century, with virtually all the increase occurring in the second half of the 20th century. Now, the interesting thing is they don't really explicitly attribute that to uh, inflation. Um, they, well, we're going to get the tables here in just a second, but they, uh, they don't say inflation is, uh, is the prim primary reason for house prices increase. They do give us other reasons, which we'll share with you. Uh, while uh, we also find considerably cross-country heterogeneity. Heterogene I, I can't pronounce stuff right. I, I know what it says. I just can't relate it to you. So if you're on the podcast, you're probably like, dude, can you learn how to talk? And the answer is no, I can't. I'm 49 years old. I can't pronounce heterogeneity correct now. It ain't going to happen. So while Australia has seen the strongest, Germany has seen the weakest increase in real house prices in the long run. Moreover, we demonstrate that urban and rural house prices have, by and large, moved together and that the long run farmland prices exhibit a similar long run pattern. We go further and study the driving force of this hockey stick pattern of house prices. Yes, this is a real hockey stick, not Michael Mann's silliness. Oh my goodness. Ah, the idea that we've been flummoxed by that guy boggles the mind, boggles the mind. But all right, so this is a real hockey stick. Houses are bundles of the structure and the underlying land. A, an accounting de decomposition of house prices, dynamics, and replacement costs of the structure and the land prices demonstrates that rising land prices hold a key to upward trend in global housing prices. While construction costs have flatlined in the past decades, mm -hmm, Sharp increases in residential land prices have driven up international house prices. Our decomposition suggests that about 80% of the increase in house prices between 1950 and 2012 can be attributed to land prices. The pronounced increase in residential land prices in recent decades contrasts starkly with the period from the late 19th to the mid 20th century. During this period, residential land prices remained by and large constant in advanced economies despite substantial population and income growth. We are not the first to note the upward trend in land prices in the second half of the century. And he cites the case again, uh, but to our, and a couple others, uh, they do. But to our knowledge, it has not been shown that this is a broad based cross country phenomenon that marks a break with the previous era. How can one explain the fact that residential land prices remained stable into the mid 20th century and increased strongly in the past half century? We discuss this both theoretically and empirically. So remember, empirically means you can observe it. Our emphasis is on the different dynamics of land supply before and after the middle of the 20th century. From the 19th to the earliest 20th century, the transport revolution, mostly the construction of railway, railway, net, railway network, but also the introduction of the steam shipping and cars, led to a massive and well-documented drop in transportation costs, often referred to as a transportation revolution. An important effect of the transportation revolution was to substantially augment the supply of the economically usable land. 
We develop a model with land heterogeneity to demonstrate how a sustained decline in transportation costs endogenous, endogenously triggers an expansion of land such that the land price may, be, may remain low despite continuous growth in incomes of population. I, I find that incredibly interesting. So they struck a, lot, a model, a sustained decline in transportation costs, right? So even though it's a sustained decline in transportation costs, land on augmenting decline in transportation costs sub, subsides in the second half of the 20th century so that land becomes an increasing fixed factor. So what they're saying is basically when there's an unlimited su uh, supply of land in the, the early part of the 20th century, uh, even the increased demand will not drive up the price. So basically the land is so, the supply of land is so high that the increase in demand is actually is, is not increasing the price. But then you fix the supply. There's now no longer an unlimited supply. There's a huge fixed supply and the demand because of huge population growth, declining transportation costs, the demand has greatly exceeded the supply and thus the prices have shot up. Still surprised they don't uh, put more emphasis on inflation, but let's just keep talking. At the same time, zoning regulations and other restrictions on land use also inhibited the utilization of land in recent decades. Well, rising expenditure share for housing services add to the further rising demand of land. So again, restrictions on land use, um, freaking EPA and whatnot, whether just their, I mean, again, you don't own anything here in the United States. The only thing you truly own is your body. So let's not pretend you actually own your property. You don't. Uh, if they can say you're a freaking creek behind you is a wetland and they can stop you from building on your own land, inherently you have no ownership, right? That's just, I mean, they do that all the time. Anyway, I find that very incredibly. So the even though the the once we fix the supply and the demand kept growing up I and mean, it kept going, then it's only inherently what's going to happen to prices. Our findings also have potentially important implications for the much debated long run trends in distribution of income and wealth. More precisely, we offer a vantage point for a reinterpretation of Ricardo's famous principle of scarcity. Ricardo, in 1817, argued that in the long run. Economic growth disproportionately profits landlords as the owners of the fixed factor. As land is highly unequally distributed across the population, market economies therefore produce ever rising level of inequality. <sighs> Writing in the night, <laughs> okay, but highly, but who gets access to the land? Harry Reeves of the world do, not old Josh, because Harry Reeves is on the in, old Josh is on the out. That's the, i.e. the landlords get access to the profits of the land, the politicians and their corporate lobbying groups. Writing in the 19th century, Ricardo was mainly concerned with the price of agricultural land and reasoned that as a population growth pushes up the price of corn, the land rent and land prices will continually increase. In the 20th century, we, be, we may be more concerned with the price of housing services and residential land, but the me mechanism is similar. The decline in transfer cost, uh, transport costs kept the price of residential land constant until the mid 20th century. Yet the price surge in the past half century could be an indication that Ricardo might have been right after all. I just restricted the land use. I mean, literally this was happening. All right, so let's just keep going. Uh, they, they, uh, they do talk about, again, the home cost construction, you know, the building, we're building, uh, they argue better quality homes, mass manufacturing. I, you know, I frankly don't know that. I, I, I hear all the time, they don't build them like they used to. I'm not so sure about that, frankly. But uh, look, I'm not in the construction trades. I don't know. I get there's something to be said about the old 1700 homes that were built by the Mennonites and the Amish and whatnot. Um, and the pilgrims, you know, they used uh, solid oak and that had been grown for 100 years and now we're throwing up, you know, stick-based man manufactured mass manufactured homes I, I don't know i don't know that I, I don't have a judgment on that but if no matter what you look at it, because of the regulations you got to have um i mean you have to have uh fire uh, alarms at every place you got to have just all this stuff regulate regulatory hell in california you gotta if you're gonna put a house on you have the solar uh, photovoltaic panels on there anytime they do that they're increasing the cost without question so they're still attributing this article that 80% of the increase in homes are due to land prices increase, which tells me right there is because the market has been eliminated because the government owns so much. But anyway, let's just go to the data here. And you can look at all this. This is, uh, you know, they use lots of fancy schmancy numbers and formulas, which, all right, so I just want to go to the data. And here, I do like this. Here's what they're, so I'm looking at United States. How are they accounting for this property vintage and type? Uh, in the U.S., they're looking from 1890 to 1934. They're looking at repeat sales uh, in urban areas. All right, so 
repeat sales, new dwellings and, and repeat sales in urban areas from 1935 to 52. Again, urban, they're looking at median prices, uh, existing dwellings, and then from uh, they're looking at Census Bureau stuff from new and existing dwellings. All right, so let's keep going down. We're going to look at the U.S., and that is, I guess, hold on, I'll pause it for a second. So the index for the U.S. covers the years 1890 to 2012. For the 1890 to 1930, uh, four period, we use a depreciation adjusted home price index for 22 cities uh, by some guy named Gebler uh, in 1956. This index is calculated using an approach similar to the repeat sales method by matching sales prices and housing values estimated by homeowners. For the years 1934 to 1974, uh, we use the house price index published by Schiller in 2009. It's based on the median residential property prices in five cities until 1952 and a weighted mixed uh, adjusted index for the entire U.S. after 1953. Uh, for 1975 and onwards, we use a weighted repeat sales index of the Federal Housing uh, Finance Agency. Between 1890, this is critical, between 1890 and 2012, U.S. house prices were increased by 150% in real terms. That's inflation adjusted. So you've, uh, let's see, 150%. That's not much in terms of, what's that? That's freaking over 100, that's about 120 years. Prices rose 1.8% per year on average until World War I, contracted during the war, but recovered during the interwar period. So between World War I and World War II. However, the extent of the price appreciation in the interwar periods continues to be debated. Uh, let's see. Following World War II, housing prices first surged, but then remained remarkably stable into the early 1990s. A couple arguments, uh, a couple folks argue that the index constructed by Schiller underestimates the housing price appreciation by the 1960s and early 70s. Several regional house price booms and busts in the 1970s and 80s are visible in the national wide index. Uh, during the real estate, during the past two decades, again, this is as of 2012, I think is when they wrote this or published this, uh, real estate values increased substantially before falling steeply after 2007. Yeah. All right, so let's keep going down here because uh, I want to show you the uh, the U.S. Uh, this is, oh, I love this right here. All right, so we're going to show you this chart. All right, so this is nominal house price index. All right, nominal house price index. All right, so let's just, I'm going to show you. Then we got CPI and then real GDP. So we're going to show you the U.S. Nominal house, we got 170N, 170, 107, excuse me, years. The full sample size, the nominal price increase was 2.9% a year. The, the, from 1890 till the end of 2012 is 2.9% a year. All right. The nominal inflation was 1.5% a year. All right. So if we go up here, all right, the inflation, uh, the average inflation, excuse me, the average inflation was 1.5% a year. And then the average GDP growth was 1.7% a year. Hope that makes sense. All right. So we have the housing sample uh, full is average 2.9% a year, uh, year over year increase of which 1.5% of that, uh, I'm not with which, but 1.5% of that, I guess you could attribute to inflation. And then the GDP was 1.7. So that's interesting. So we got GDP growth, 1.7. We got inflation, 1.5. Add those two together, we got two, uh, what's that, 3.2. And yet the gr housing growth has been 2.9. So the pre-World War, the 42 years from 1890 to pre-World War, the average house grew by 1.5%. Uh, basically, it had no inflation. It was a little bit of a deflationary. It's like a point less than 1% each and every year deflationary. So each and every year, um, the value, the price went down. It was a deflation. And the GDP was up by 1.5. So that's a phenomenal year for growth for the U.S. and emerging markets territory. But again, we have uh, inflation was essentially not exist was, was literally not existing, not essentially. And our growth on the home uh, mimicked that of of the average price of the home to the GDP. And it's interesting here. So now we go to 2000 post World War, 65 years. Uh, so basically 1945 till 2012, the average home grew by 3.8%. And that's the nominal rate. But inflation was 3.6%. Ah, so GDP was 2%. So that's interesting. How do you attribute that? So if you factor in inflation and GDP, uh, relative to what it was the full sample, you would think that inflation, that the average home should have grown by 5.6%, but then it only grew by 3.8%.
which is almost identical to inflation. Pretty interesting, huh? So basically, the history of home value appreciation is 2.9%, but that is divided up to 1.5% pre-World uh, War II and then 3.8% post-World War II. But the 3.8% post-World War II was eaten almost 100% by inflation. So I think that what you need to do here is you need to say, as I'm going to scroll down a little bit, is you got to just say at the end of the day, you should use your real estate increase in your home uh, as, as uh, to appreciate, especially using the right capital software that you use to whatever you think inflation is going to be. I, I think that's about the best you can do. So let's go down to, uh, to the U.S. here. I'm going to show you the various graphs. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for that. I just think at the end of the day, uh, you're not going to get, and again, look, it's all, we know this, it's all based on your location, location, location. Um, and here is, let's see, share of GDP, hold on, land prices, hold on just a sec. I'm going to show you the chart for you. Only pause it for a second. Hold on a sec. Here's a chart. I was just looking at it. So basically you can see in uh, 1890 to you know 1945 is flat. You know, home prices literally did hardly anything at all. Uh, then it started going up a little bit, and then uh, that's, look at that, lo and behold, coincides with what exactly? Oh, that's the inflationary years of the 70s, and then it just took off like a bat out of hell. Um, and then it's down here as of 2012. But anyway, you can see, see, that's the problem with financial planning. It, this is an anomaly, and if we get rid of that anomaly from 1970 to 19, basically 66 to 82, what does that change things? But then you look here, this is 1995 to right there. And I you got to true that to Clinton, wanting home ownership at all costs. Um, you know, the CRA, Community Reinvestment Act and whatnot, and just the, the ninja loans, no income, no jobs or assets. And look at that increase. And then it fell back. And I, look, so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think at the end of the day, if you're going to look at this right here and say that has some kind of semblance of reality, I think you can say, no, nah, that's not true. But you have a run up here from basically 1980 to 1990, a pretty significant decline. Uh, then you got a run up from basically 1995 to 2007 and really 2006. So if you do a, a model of this, you know, these run ups are not the, the it'd be kind of like a, more of a adjusted line like that, but still an increase. And that's gotta be doing inflation, cheap money and more regulations on land and, uh, and just the cost of your home. But anyway, it's certainly higher than it was before. So I think a 3% uh, rate is probably pretty, uh, you know, 2 to 3%. I think looking at it as what you think inflation is would make sense to give you a value of your, of your home. Now, I will just go back. My wife lived in a town in Virginia, which she did not get. Her mom did not get any value of it when they bought it in the 60s. And they sold it when she died. And I think 2008 is when we sold it. Um, it went up just a little bit, but certainly not to the extent that we got uh, inflationary adjusted each and every year. But it did have an increase in value, simply because a dollar fell relative to what they paid. On the other hand, my granddad bought a house in 1967 in Los Altos, California. And when my grandma died in 2010, 12, they sold that sucker for a price uh, without question. Um, and so it just it is location, location, location. But this convinces me that you should use your... Um, uh, uh, real house price index. Yeah. So you can see that, uh, um, you should use your, and the, 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 the shades of the war times too, by the way, um, just that S Y I. All right. So what does that sell us? You should look at your real estate as a, uh, let me get me up here. All right. So you should use your real estate, looking at it as a sense of that. You're going to get it with adjusted for inflation each and every year. No, oh, that's, that's weird. It's all off. No more, no less. All right, so there we go. Your old buddy Josh has got me way up on high on my face there. <laughs> hey, guys. Peace. Peace. It's, uh, ooh, that's kind of weird. If I show my face, look at that. You'll see it. There I am. <laughs> that's kind of creepy. <laughs> anyway, so you're going to get your, uh, you're going to get your real estate. You should use it relative to your inflation rate. That's what I'm saying when it comes to your financial planning. All right. Well, I'll leave that to you. Hope this helps. Smash. And we'll see you next time.